everyone. How are you all doing? I know I've been gone for a while, but I'm back again. And um, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, but today we're going to go over some practice problems. Um, so these problems, I would say, are maybe like medium level. They may be a bit difficult, um, but I want to go over these questions, give you all explanations on why the questions are correct, and hopefully help you continue to study um, for your exam. So I have some announcements. Some people have been asking me, you know, am I doing study groups or anything like that? I am not doing study groups. I stopped doing study groups. My schedule is very busy. That's why I have not posted as much as I would like to, but I'm going to try my best to post as well as if you have me or you are subscribed to me, I'm gonna try my best to um, put like um, questions of the week on my community tab and things like that so I can keep um, engaged and give you all content and things like that. Um, so let's just get right into these questions. Also, I know a lot of people say I talk really fast. I'm from New York. I apologize. What I would suggest for people to do if my voice is too quick is to slow down the speed, put it at like 0.5 or something like that. So that way it can be a bit easier for you to follow me. Um, but I get it. I know I do talk fast. <laughs> so let's get right into the first question. So the first question is a client whose adolescent son is acting out feels that his behavior may indicate the essence of evil spirits within him. The client would like to discuss these thoughts with her spiritual leader in order to most, let me put that, most appropriately address this, right? The most appropriate way to address this um, client's request, the social worker should A, advise the client that seeing her spiritual leader will not be helpful, B, inform the client that this behavior is typical of adolescents, C, work with the client to formulate her thoughts and questions for the meeting. And D, ask the client why she thinks that evil spirits are present. So I want people to take a minute to really think about what the correct answer is. So before I go over the answer, please comment or drop it in the chat what you put for number one before I gave you the answer and the rationale. Okay, so here, the correct answer would be to formulate her thoughts and questions for the meeting with her spiritual leader. And here is why, why, right? As social workers, as clinicians, we want to respect people's beliefs, right? We want to be culturally humble. We don't want to put our own beliefs onto other people. We don't want to disrespect anybody else's beliefs. And in this case, the best way for you to go about this as a social worker is to work with the client to formulate her thoughts, questions um, for the meeting. When you do that, right, you're respecting their beliefs. You're empowering them, right? You're you're being you're you're having open communication with your client, as well as you're being culturally sensitive and humble, and you're being collaborative. So in this situation, right, C is the correct answer, right? You really want to think about that, right? Being culturally humble, culturally sensitive when it comes to working with people who may have different beliefs or beliefs that we may not understand. Um, right? We want to take on a curious lens. So here, the best answer is C, right? If you picked any of the other answers, I would like for you to drop in the comments why you picked the other answers. You know, the first one, advise the client that seeing her spiritual leader will not be helpful. How do you know that, right? Maybe it may not be helpful for you, but it may be helpful for the client. Second one, inform the client that this behavior is typical of adolescents. I don't know if I believe that, right? I don't know how old the adolescent is, right? evil spirits, if he watched a video or something and he's talking about that, then yeah, but we don't know where that's coming from, right? So we don't want to assume anything or put our own biases when it comes to interpreting the um, the information that the uh, client gave you. And D, ask the client why she thinks the evil spirit is the present. I mean, okay, you can ask that question, but you know, that may have its own negative effects. So you really want to be mindful of, of why you, you are asking these, these kind of questions and things like that. The best answer here is to work with the client to formulate her thoughts and questions for the meeting, okay? Right, we want to think about it. In this answer, we are empowering the client to express themselves. We're respecting their beliefs. We're promoting open communication, um, and we are being collaborative with them. That's what we want to do. So uh, C is the correct answer. Next question, question number two. So a client who gives birth after um, an unwanted pregnancy is an overprotective mother who talks obsessively about what she does for her child. The client's behavior is most likely attributed to which of the following defense mechanisms. Okay, so in this one, you got to know what these defense mechanisms mean. So the first one, 
reactive formation. Next one, dissociation. C is conversion. D is displacement. So I'm going to give you all time to think about what the correct answer is. So the correct answer here is A, right? Reaction formation. Oh, sorry, I did the wrong one. Please forgive me. Let me go here. I'm supposed to highlight here. So it's reaction formation, right? So reaction formation is a defense mechanism in which a person behaves in a manner that is opposite of their true feelings or desires, right? It involves expressing exaggerated, um, overcompensating behaviors to cover up the, you know, unconscious thoughts or feelings that are considered socially unacceptable or maybe, you know, anxiety or emotionally provoking. So in this scenario, right, the client's behavior of being overprotective, right, and obsessively talking about their child, you know, um, is a form of reaction formation, right? There may be an unconscious desire or feeling that might be driving her behavior um, to be this way because she has unresolved feelings, maybe about the unwanted pregnancy, right? Um, so A is the correct answer, right? When we think about these different um, defense mechanism, dissociation, conversion, displacement, um, those wouldn't be appropriate regarding this um, scenario. So that is why A is uh, the correct answer. If you all would want, um, I can do a video on the different defense mechanisms. I don't know if any, I think, I feel like I saw a comment where someone said that, but if you all want, I can break them down step by step um, if that would be helpful. But A is the correct answer. And lastly, so we got a client reports that his young daughter just began talking, right? At the, uh, this developmental milestone, what can the client assume to be true about the relationship between her expressive and receptive language and skills? Aha. So this one, right? Thinking about receptive and expressive language, right? And their young daughter. So... A, the child has attained all um, her receptive language, promoting the emergence of expressive language. B, the child's expressive language is likely more um, advanced than receptive language. C, the child will now start to develop receptive language skills that um, as they emerge after expressive language. D, um, the child's receptive language is likely more advanced than her expressive language. So I got a question, right? I want you to drop in the tab before going, which one do you think comes first, receptive language or expressive language, right? When it comes to um, developmental milestones, expressive or receptive? I want you to think about it. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> so during early um, language development, it's more common that a child has receptive language skills to be more advanced than their expressive um, language skills, right? When we think of receptive, language, right? That refers to a child's ability to understand and comprehend language, right? It involves processing, spoken word, gestures, nonverbal cues, all that good stuff. When we get into expressive language, this refers to a child's ability to produce language to convey their thoughts, needs, and ideas, right? So like a baby, they can know like when it's time to eat, right? They may open their mouth, things like that. They're being receptive. They may, they're not telling you to eat, but they, they know that you're, you, you know, you are telling them to eat. They're receiving what you're saying. They're able to understand what you are saying to them versus them saying, I need to eat or I'm feeling sad, right? That comes a little bit more um, later down the line. Um, so here, right, um, the correct answer would be answer D, right? The child's receptive language is likely more advanced than her expressive language. So let me highlight that. And, you know, there's a couple of reasons to why, right, receptive language um, comes first, right? There's something called like our observational learning, right? Nonverbal communication, um, you know, all those things. Also, experimentation with, with children, right? That them trying things out, like, okay, what does this mean, right? Um, so all those things will help or aid in um, a child's ability to develop their receptive language versus their expressive language. Um, not saying it can never happen, um, that a child's expressive language can't be developed quick, but for most children, their receptive language develops first. So, you know, here, you know, when you think of like early stages of development, um, 
a child's receptive language will come first. This is due to observational learning and nonverbal communication and, um, and things like that. So I hope this was helpful. I know this is my first video back. Uh, feel a little rusty, <laughs> but I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I went over today, please just leave a comment in the chat. Also, I just want to give people a bit of motivation. If you are studying for your clinical license, if you are studying for your first license, your LMSW, you know, you got this. You know, something to really think about is um, everybody's different. And I really, really highly recommend for people to figure out the best way that they learn and learn that way. You know, trial and error. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'll see you all next time. If you have any suggestions, please leave a comment in my chat. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day.